I'm uh, incredibly honored to be standing on a stage where I've heard uh, such uh, moving, inspiring, um, amazingly unbelievable tales of uh, can do. And um, I guess my story also revolves around that. I, um, I thought really long and hard about this. Thriving uh, innovation that creates uh, a business to thrive is is a very it's an it's an oxymoron it's a, it's a dichotomy actually in the world that I live in. I work in couture. Uh, I'm a traditionalist. I love trying to save every single embroidery, every single um, old um, technique as much as possible. Um, having been brought up outside of uh, Pakistan. I'm obsessed with Pakistan. Uh, it gives me the certain sense of hope and belonging that no other country has. So I wasn't sure exactly where this conversation was going to go. And then I thought to myself, the most important conversation is the one that's the most authentic. And even though I wasn't, I wasn't really sure I was going to go this direction, I think it's a story that's important to tell because the lesson learned from it is not one of um, uh, being a martyr or being sad or uh, feeling in any way some sympathy is actually quite something else. What is innovation? We always, we often strive for innovation without, i.e. outside. How can we better ourselves? How can we advance? How can we learn new techniques? How can we move forward? I have found in these last few months, a year and a half perhaps, that I think the real innovation really is within. Let me tell you how, where it starts. So I don't bore na kuru jaldi bolunga. Whoever seen my other last two TED talks will know that I always talk about my career and how I started. I was a poor kid. I wasn't a rich kid. Miriam me jyoti wo meek saal ka tha jab unki divorce ho gayi thi. Or not just a divorce, but she actually left the country. So we grew up relatively very, very lower middle class. I grew up, uh, but I remember one thing that my, whatever my mother did, she focused on our education. We came from a family of education and education was crucial. But work was also crucial. For all those who know, I started working. My first job was at the age of 12. And at the age of 15, I was completely self-sufficient and self um, paying for my education and myself. It's not a thank you. It's not a victory. I, I, it's what you have to do. I, these are things that you have to do. But why I say that is because life was wonderful. I gave speeches I speeches. I lost my eyesight for two years. I uh, had to go through blindness. Um, my uh, Education almost didn't happen. I was picking up bricks at a construction site to pay for my fashion school. But all of those ended in a fantastic brand called HSY. And I thought, that's amazing. So let me take you back to 2019 going into 2020. 2019 going into 2020, I host a big, lavish New Year's party at my house in Karachi. And I think, my God, amazing. I've done a great job. A few weeks later, I'm in Dubai. It's the International Fashion Awards. And I win Designer of the Year. And I'm thrilled. This is amazing. Of course, this is happening to me. A few weeks later, I'm in Thailand doing stunt training for a motion picture that I'm doing for the first time in my life by one of the best stunt people in the world. Life couldn't be better. Or at least, in my mind, I thought, I've gone through all my hurdles gone through every single thing that I needed to do, and now life was perfect. It wasn't just COVID. Something changed. I started my business on the 23rd of March, 1994. I was a teenager. I had gone to audition for a fashion show, and in auditioning for a fashion show, because I had so many scars on my face from my accident, um, they wouldn't take me as a model, so I thought I'll do one step better, and I convinced them to take me as a director. That was 23rd March, and it's always held a very important place in my heart. Fast forward, 2020, 23rd March. I come back from, 
I come back from Thailand. I'm sorry, this is a little emotional for me. I wasn't really going to go here, but I will. So I come back from Thailand. And I'm firstly met with this incredible fear. Um, there's COVID. Everything is shut down. I haven't seen my mother in three weeks. I've been speaking to her. But I find out, and she's telling me the same thing. Now, if, you know, if anyone knows me, knows that um, my mother is the center of my world. So I come home. And I'm going to phone her and she's hurting and she's hurting and she's hurting and she's hurting and she can't move. And of course, all the doctors are saying that it's muscle pain. So that's what they're diagnosing her for. I come back to you. You will remember that at that time, 14 days of quarantine was very important. So I come home and I go uh, and I quarantine myself. And I come out on the 22nd of March um, from the quarantine from Thailand to find that my wife, she can't even move. She can't go to the bathroom. She has no movement. And this does not look like a back pain that is just a back pain. But this is when all that, this isn't the only thing that was going on. Systematically, things would happen that would break my entire fabric apart. Two weeks later, my father would have a stroke that would leave him paralyzed from one half of his body. My mother would be bedbound. A woman, you'll know that she is so incredibly energetic. She runs educational institutions. She is a mentor. But beyond that, she is the mother to everyone. And this woman couldn't move. She couldn't see. She had to lay in bed and look at a fan go round and round for the next nine months of her life because she couldn't do anything. 23rd March comes along. The day that 23rd March happens, you will remember that lockdown was lockdown. They said that lockdown was lockdown. So, now I have to go to my I know my father's not feeling well. And I go and put the tala on my factory. And I remember that everyone had put the tala on their factory and everyone had put the tala on their factory and thought when we will come back. So on 23rd March, I went and put a tala on my factory, not knowing that there was to be a pitfall there too. Um, on the 24th of March, when we had shut down, the next day there were more vendors and more screaming people outside my factory than I'd ever seen. It turned out that besides my mother falling sick, my father being paralyzed, my own business part, my own business managers who had been with me for 18 years had been siphoning money and had not been paying all of the rents, all of the vendors, and actually been siphoning the money for themselves. And they left on the 24th of March because suddenly there was no court of law. You couldn't take, anyone to act, couldn't take any action on anyone. Everyone was free to go. And my business of 27 years on the very day that I began it, shut down. I had no business. I had no business. I had a mother whose medical bills were amounting to about 15 lakh rupees a month. My business relies on the delivery of bridles, which the biggest bridal season is March, April. So we had hundreds of completed bridles and no weddings and no one willing to take them. Zero cash flow, sick mom, sick dad, money needed to treat both of them. And me, HSY, king of couture, the biggest boy in the world, my God, leading face of fashion, blah, blah, blah. He had nothing. The world stopped. And it didn't stop, and I didn't think, oh my God, it stopped, I'm going to jump right back up. I had no solution. So I sat. I sat, and I think I did what all of us did during that time. We paused. I paused for a couple of days, not for a couple of months, because there was a looming situation about making sure that all of the medical bills were paid. And you know, um, when COVID also happened, there was I couldn't take anyone to the hospital, so I had to create hospitals at home, both at my father's place and at my mother's. This wasn't a small task. And I'm the only son. I have a sister who lives abroad, but I'm the caretaker. I've been the caretaker since I can well remember. And I love being that. It's, it's a role that I love. Innovation is not going to come from outside. It's going to come from within. And what is within? It is our experiences. You have to tap into every experience you have. 
And I thought to myself, Hassan, you have the experience of having done a talk show when no one else was doing a talk show because you wanted to do it to make sure that the capacity of you having ability to speak was at least strong enough. So you have that. You don't have a television network because no one wants you on television right now, but you've got this little phone. And what does everybody want right now? Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to be felt safe. We don't want to turn on television on and have some screaming telecaster tell us the world's coming to an end. Everyone was out to destroy everyone else. But no one was listening to each other. So I thought, here's your one situation. Start a show called Live with HSY. Start, it'll save you because you have nothing else to do. And what do you have that is your own biggest one single victory in life? And that's ikhlaq. That's one thing that I learned immediately. The one thing that I have is I have the love of people who I've worked with. Because I've been taught to treat them with respect by my mom from the get-go. So I started live with HSY. It was a funny show, by the way. I had everyone and everyone on it. But of course, I was making money off it too. And I got in touch with all of the um, multinationals who had no advertising at all happening anywhere. So I said, Aquafina, you know what? I'm going to have your bottle of water. I'm going to have 26 consumption shots while I'm talking. And oh, Lipton, I'll also have your tea as well. But because I don't want my, I don't want my guests to feel bad, I'll hold them separately and I'll have both. So I would be doing an interview, like with, for example, Harim Farooq. I would be saying, tell me more about how you feel. Actually, very, very interested in how she feels, but still remembering, I better have a cup of, sip of this tea while the dhuwa's coming out because Lipton's going to kill me. Sip, burn. Oh, and then I better have a consumption of cold water. Oh, so if you note that, I'm constantly like jumping up and people thought, my God, he's so excited. I swear I was burning my mouth constantly. But we ended up doing... 46 episodes of amazing shows that were enough to be able to pay for my mother's medical for the next six months. We all have hopes and aspirations. When we get up out of our bed, we don't think, today I'm an architect. We think, today I'm a person. Today I want to sing. Today I want to dance. Today I want to act. Today I want to cry, and today I want to fight. I don't want to always keep creating. And I'd forgotten that about myself. You become so regimented being every single thing that other people want you to be, the superstar, the non unstoppable, the guy with the pizzazzy atmosphere and attitude that will come into a room and he'll have to own the room. And you know, then you're constantly having to own the room, forgetting the fact that you're still a human being. You're still a five-year-old you left behind somewhere who's saying, wait, 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 I want to do other things. So I listened to that guy, turned it into strategy. I thought, wait, what's the best way of doing advertising and marketing without having to pay for it on one of the largest networks in Pakistan? Come on it. Come on a television show that will come every Saturday, and they'll remember HSY every Saturday, and I don't have to pay for advertising. From that, my studios. All my studio spaces shut down. And I thought about another thing. I said, you know, I had a studio space here. It looked very European. I had a studio space here. It looked this. It looked... Who, what do I like? I'm obsessed with Pakistan. I want to make something that is truly Pakistani. Mera product mein koi gora pan hai nahi. Agar koi aata hai kisi batakh wala bridal chahiye ya ya batakh chahiye ya ek sleeve itna bada chahiye. Um, I get destroyed by media and press all the time because I'm not innovative, but I'm not here to be innovative. I've got my finger on the pulse of the Pakistani woman, the Pakistani woman who has to go home and be with her husband, with her father-in-law, with her sister, with her brother, and she needs to wear clothes that represent her. She doesn't need to be Parisian. She doesn't need to be from London. She's Pakistani, and she celebrates. And what do we have to celebrate the most is our craft, our culture, and our heritage. So I thought, why is my studio not looking like that? When, if anyone knows, I'm a little obsessed with numbers, so when I got my studio, um, my first studio was 20 years ago. It, I, I love the number 23. It, it's a five, and I just feel it's a middle number, and it's just a good number. So I had this studio called 23 um, on Gulberg, and it was a very, it's a famous studio because it's been there for 20 years, and a lot of people even refer to it as the HSY Road. So when all the buildings were taken away, I suddenly realized that that was being taken away as well. But... Um, but uh, Shahid Saab said uh, something really wonderful. He said that there's something to be left to God. And that same day, I used to be in a studio called 23B. 
and 23A were these three decrepit, horrible buildings that were built by, if anyone knows anything about movies, Zeba and Muhammad Ali were the big stars of their day, and I truly think the true icons of this country. Unke ghar ke saath ek, unke director saap ne ghar banaya tha, jo 1951 mein banata, aur uski jo chhat thi, wo uski original chhat wo hai, jab Pakistan mein ever new studios or movie studios ban rahe the, uski pehli chhat wahan dali thi. But it was horrible, decrepit, broken. And I didn't have a studio. My 26 seconds are again. Do you mind if I speak for two more minutes? Don't want to bore you. So during this time when I didn't have a studio, I came back to the basics. I started seeing clients at home, came right back to where I started, and I started realizing that every single thing that I've been thinking that I need to do as HSY has always been manufactured and has been an innovation that has been given to me by someone else. So and so is doing this, you do this. Ilan is doing this, Khati is doing this, Faraz Banan is doing this, you do that too. And I realized that's not what I need to do. People resonate to something that is truly authentic. And me, authentically, I've always loved making that one thing that I love to make, which is traditional bridles in the color red. Why am I doing ready to wear? Why am I even stepping out to do something that isn't necessarily part and parcel of who I am? So we started seeing clients at home, and the, the effect of the clients actually sitting down and working with me was so tremendous that within the six months that I saw clients at home, I was able to raise enough money to build what is now the largest couture studio in Pakistan that is made with only Pakistani materials. When people say London, Paris, Milan, we say Gujarawala, Sialkot, and Multan. And that makes me incredibly proud. So my point being, which I know I've taken it to many different places, I've realized that when the chips are down and you need to innovate to thrive, look into yourself. The real innovation really truly lies within you. Be authentic to yourself. Too fast, too soon, we become unauthentic. And I know it's a very small word, but if you really think about it, unauthentic is a big, big feeling. Be authentic to who you are, however you are, whatever God has given you. And when you tap into those emotions, those experiences, that's your DNA. No one has those experiences. You and I can walk through this place together and your experience and my experience will be different. Respect your experience. Build on your experience. Build in those innovations. And if you really want to thrive with innovation, thrive with innovation within your heart. Thank you so much.